Hopewell, New Jersey is the land of hope and, well, money. And lots of it. But when a scandalous murder taints the town's perfect image, the fine people of Hopewell learn there are some things money can't buy. Like the guarantee to live a long and happy life. If this is your first time viewing the grandeur of Hopewell's fine homes, no doubt you're impressed. But just outside these elite neighborhoods, you'll find the common folk. People like avid hunter Richard Archer. At 10, he killed his first buck. At 40, he found his first dead body. It was early morning. We were on our way to get some breakfast with a friend of mine. We were driving along Jacobs Creek Road, and I'm looking for deer. Then all of a sudden, I see a, a land cruiser, and it's in the middle of the stream bed. Richard goes in for a closer look. What he sees inside the car stops him cold. I go out onto the edge of the running board and look in there, and here's this lady with her eyes wide open. She was hunched over on the, um, the console. Uh, it was just, it was horrifying. Richard calls for help. 911, where is your emergency? Accident investigator John Ryan gets the call. I received the call in early morning hours, the morning of the incident. Our unit responded out to Jacob Creek Road uh, after a report of a fatal motor vehicle accident. When I arrived at the scene, I noticed that there were tire impressions that came right through this area here, between the edge of the fence and the tree line. The tire impressions continued in this direction here towards the creek. We approached the vehicle, looked inside, and uh, observed that there was a female inside. She was hunched over to the right. There were some severe injuries noted to her forehead. There was a lot of blood located around the vehicle, inside and outside. The whole area was secured. The roadway was shut down. Um, and we began processing the scene at that point. It's a sad tragedy for the woman and her family. But who are they? The investigation revealed that the vehicle was registered to Dr. Jonathan Nice, and the woman inside, the description appeared to be consistent with Michelle Nice, the doctor's wife. While investigators call Michelle's husband, Larissa Seuss is wondering why her best friend is late for their favorite activity. Stop. Friday morning, Michelle was going to come to my house uh, for us to do the scrapbooking. And then at 9 o'clock, for some reason, I just had this need to call her. Jonathan answers. And he's told me that he needs to call me back because uh, the police are here telling him that they just found Michelle's car, that, that, that there has been an accident. For Michelle's grieving husband, Jonathan, the loss is unbearable. Together, he and Michelle had built a dream life with three perfect children in this perfect New Jersey town. They built this 7,000 square foot house. He would buy her a Hummer. I mean, money was not an object. But all the money in the world can't buy her life back. News of Michelle's death travels fast. Even the lovely ladies at the Doll and Toy Museum hear of the fatal tragedy. Well, there was an accident down on Jacobs Creek Road. An SUV was found down in the ditch in the water. I'm not at all surprised because the road is so narrow and so winding. Anybody could slide off that embankment right down into that uh, creek bed. Doesn't surprise me a single bit. Back at the scene, investigators continue to assess the accident. They call in Detective Jeff Noble from the New Jersey State Patrol. Initially, uh, I responded at the request of Hopewell Township Police Department simply to assist in making the determination if the facts at the scene warranted a further investigation. And when he studies the scene, one detail stands out. The car, in fact, had very minor damage. Normally, a motor vehicle accident where there's a fatality, the impact is such that you would expect to see serious damage to the vehicle itself. Could this be more than a fatal fender bender? Investigators hope that the photos taken at the scene may expose the truth. 
But the big thing is the amount of blood on the outside of the car. And also on this picture, you can see that the blood was deposited in the area of the door jam, which would indicate the door had to be open when that blood was transferred. It appears Michelle was bleeding before she got into the car. Also, the footprints leading from the vehicle clearly show that there was somebody else uh, in the vehicle on the passenger side after that vehicle came to rest. But where is this mysterious person now? Perhaps this was no accident after all, but simply staged to look like one. Based on this, I think there's a strong chance that Michelle Nice was the victim of a homicide. The official report supports his theory. The autopsy report confirmed that Michelle Nice received multiple blows to the top area of the forehead, suggesting it did not happen in one incident. Clearly, this is no accident. This is murder. But in Hopewell, perhaps there's more than meets the eye in this wealthy town. Coming up, could a scandalous skeleton in Michelle's past lead investigators to her killer? Hopewell, New Jersey is home to some of America's wealthiest executives. You see all these fancy rich people that live up there and they're all pharmaceutical people. They have everything. They have all the, every new toy, beautiful homes. They have people that mow their yards for them. And inside the mansions are young ladies who can't keep a secret. Do you remember that car accident I was telling you about? Mm -hmm. So when murder rips through the small town, the teenagers have lots to chat about. It turns out she was actually murdered. Like, I can't believe that would happen. Mm -hmm. I wonder who it was. Whom indeed. For Detective Jeff Noble of the New Jersey State Police, only one thing is clear. He has a killer on the loose. On a case like this, certainly due to the, uh, the violence of the crime itself, the nature in which Michelle Mice was murdered, we certainly needed to put a lot of resources and a lot of time immediately into trying to solve this crime. Detective Noble starts with the basics. The first step in this investigation was ultimately to determine where Michelle Nice was and what the circumstances uh, were leading up to her death. Uh, so to do that, we went to uh, Dr. Nice's house to speak with him. Nice recounts the last time he spoke to his wife the night before she was found dead. She had told him that she was going to work until about nine o'clock, and then she was gonna go out with a friend of hers, meaning go out for a night in the town. He had tried to call her several times over the course of the night. And technology supports his alibi. We checked his phone records, and we did in fact confirm that he had tried to contact Michelle Nice on her phone. During the hours of nine, p.m. and midnight. Dr. Nice's story checks out. The detectives are at a dead end until Dr. Nice gives them their next big break. Dr. Nice may not have been the only love in Michelle's life. Dr. Nice reported that he had received a telephone call from a gentleman who reportedly had a audio tape of Michelle Nice involved in a sexual situation. And this uh, caller reportedly demanded cash from Dr. Nice uh, in exchange for the tape. A half million dollars to be exact. And this caller was no stranger. In fact, it was the Nice's former gardener, a fellow named Miguel de Jesus. Miguel, uh, he went by the nickname Enyo. A lot of people knew him by that name, Enyo. But in addition to that, we knew that he had used uh, other aliases. Um, the other names he had used were Jose Pinata, Sergio Martinez, Alexander Castaneda. It appears the gardener with many names is trying to stay one step ahead of the law. And that gives the local teens plenty of juicy gossip. They found her dead in well, I heard she was having an affair with the gardener. Why would she have an affair? I mean, she comes here, marries a doctor, and she's got all this nice stuff. I know, she had everything she ever wanted. Or did she? 
Dr. Nice doesn't believe the rumors and isn't the type to give in to blackmail. Instead, he called the police and filed for a restraining order. Certainly, when you learn that a murder victim has an active restraining order against somebody else, uh, it becomes very compelling information. Investigators wonder if this shifty ex-con has made the jump from landscaper to extortionist to murderer. While investigating the restraining order, detectives learned Miguel's alleged affair with Michelle was no hoax. When we learned of the facts surrounding her affair with Miguel de Jesus, uh, we wanted to pay very close attention to that and investigate that thoroughly. Investigators bring Miguel in for questioning. He tells detectives the restraining order didn't curb their passion. Their late night tryst continued up until the final moments of her life. Based on Miguel's timeline that he provided to us, it appeared that Miguel de Jesus was the last one to have seen Michelle Nice alive. When the gardener's extortion attempt failed, did he plan the ultimate revenge? That's coming up next on Suburban Secrets. Words out in Hopewell that the late Michelle Nice had some naughty secrets of her own. He caught her in a sleazy motel out on Route 1 there. I can't believe somebody living the way her lifestyle was, and she's having an affair in a motel with a gardener. One night stand kind of place. Yeah, hourly rates. That'll tell you something about the place. I can't believe something like that would happen in this town. It's like Mayberry and Hopewell. Michelle's secret lover, Miguel the gardener, is now under police interrogation. He tells police what happened that night. Well, Miguel that night uh, essentially said that after Michelle got done work uh, at approximately 9 o'clock at night, and they drove to the Mount Motel, which is located nearby. And uh, while there, they were there for about two hours until approximately midnight. Shortly after midnight, uh, they departed the motel, and he went his way, and she went her way. Looks like Miguel is a love him and leave him kind of guy. But could he also be a cold-blooded killer? After um, hearing the information provided by Miguel, we checked phone records. Uh, we did everything that we could do to check on Miguel's story. And in the end, the gardener's hands are clean. Based on our investigation, we had no evidence to suggest that Miguel de Jesus was directly connected to the death of Michelle Nice. With the lusty gardener dismissed as a suspect, Speculation in this well-heeled town takes a shocking turn. Even the boys with toys at the luxury car dealership can't put their curious minds to rest. You, you know the doctor was in some financial difficulty. Could Michelle's husband, Dr. Nice, be up to no good? He started a business, uh, a pharmaceutical business that was doing very well. He had come up with a new drug but unfortunately it wasn't approved and he lost everything. He was under a lot of stress, I would think, if he's having you know, severe financial problems. Absolutely. The house was a $2 million house. If he lost everything, I'm sure he was viewing the world much differently and people do crazy things. Sure, the doctor was having problems, but is he desperate enough to be involved with his wife's murder? Well, the, the initial statement that we received from Dr. Nice on the morning of Michelle's death, uh, there were some issues that we had. Such as? One of the biggest concerns initially at the scene was the footprints that were found leaving the car. And coincidentally, the Nice family home is less than a mile from the crime scene. A possible link, perhaps? Due to the close proximity from the scene to the house, um, we at least had to investigate the connection between the scene of the crime and the house. Uh, and that's ultimately why we wanted to get a search warrant for the house. Investigators search the Nice's home for hours, looking for any clues to connect Dr. Nice to the murder. It was a very uh, large, very beautiful home. Uh, it took us a long time to go through that house. But their hard work pays off. We found uh, pieces of a 
boot sole, a rubber boot sole, which had been cut up into numerous pieces. Why would the nice doctor cut up a perfectly good pair of boots? We had dropped off the uh, pieces of the soles of the boot that we found in the nice residence of the crime lab. Forensic scientist Ed Gainsbourg puts the pieces of this bizarre puzzle together. Hey, Ed. Hey, Jeff. You got the uh, pieces that you get recovered from Dr. Nice's house. This is right here, reassembled, complete sole. Gainsbourg compares the sole to a plaster cast. Now, this plaster cast is the one taken uh, from the footwear impression in the snow uh, out at the scene. Out at the scene near the car, right. Will the plaster cast match the sole? This impression has the same manufacturer's design and size as the impression in the snow. So it's a good chance these are the shoes. For investigators, the implications are clear. So essentially, the, um, the boots found uh, at the house match from the, uh, the footprints found out at the scene. That's correct, yes. Things don't look good for the nice doctor. But this bizarre tale isn't over yet. Coming up next, the doctor has a shocking story that seems to prove his innocence. Investigators are one footstep closer to solving the murder of Michelle Nice. With the tread evidence in hand, Detective Noble brings in Dr. Nice for an interview. Right away, he deflects blame back to the gardener. Jonathan Nice um, repeatedly talked about the extortion attempt and uh, had implied that Michelle was hanging with the wrong people, referring to uh, Miguel de Jesus. I called back and asked for $500,000 if I wanted to see the tapes back. But when detectives mention Michelle was with Miguel the night she died, the doctor loses his cool. That seemed to make an emotional connection to Dr. Nice. And at that point, Dr. Nice essentially uh, broke down and, and talked about what actually happened that night. This is the moment investigators have been waiting for. Uh, when she arrived at the house, she pulled her Toyota Land Cruiser into the three-car garage. He said that he uh, confronted her as she exited her vehicle. And at that time, there's a hostile exchange between the two. But how did she end up dead? Dr. Nice explains. I don't know. I'm just asking her questions about her. And then she, for no reason that I know of, I mean, I was coming closer to help her out. She took something out of her bag and lunged at me right in my face, right in my, my neck. Dr. Nice uh, alleged that she came at him. She lunged at him with some type of sharp object. She came out, but before she could get much momentum, I had my hands up around her shoulder and away from sight. I threw her down, threw her down too hard, I know, but I didn't mean to. He describes the scene as an accident. For some reason, she did not move her limbs the way I would have expected. She just blew out and hit with a sickening thunk on the, with her head on the, on, the, on the pavement. The force of the blow killed Michelle, and Dr. Nice panicked. So he thought the best course of action for the sake of his children was to uh, clean up the crime scene uh, and move the body and try to stage the motor vehicle accident. But how in the world did he drive the car and crash it into the creek? Dr. Nice stated that once he positioned Michelle Nice in the driver's seat of her vehicle, and from the passenger seat, he was able to operate the vehicle using an ice scraper to control the pedals and leaning over with his hand to control the, the steering wheel. Dr. Nice's confession ultimately ends in arrest. He is charged with second-degree murder. For Michelle's best friend, the truth is hard to swallow. I was just, like, de devastated. I mean, I cried. I mean, first of all, I was crying the fact that she's gone and then the fact that he's responsible for her murder. And all I can think about was the, the three kids. At the trial, 
Dr. Nice claims self-defense, but the jury doesn't buy it. He is convicted of murdering his wife, Michelle Nice. They did find the element of passion provocation was present. Uh, as a result, his sentence was reduced significantly from what it would normally have been, and he was sentenced to seven years in state prison. Hearing of the conviction stirs up plenty of opinions from the local town folk. And to think that he's getting off with seven years for murder. I thought people went away to prison for their whole lives if they murdered somebody. I think he should have had the book thrown at him. And those outside the city limits, like Richard Archer, have a different point of view. All the money in the world never brings these people happiness. They all, they all seem to falter at one thing or another from almost the root of the evil of the money. Behind the veil, the perception of the perfect town and the perfect home may not result in the perfect life. Unfortunately, the good citizens of Hopewell have had to learn this the hard way.